Happy Sabbath, church. Welcome to Pakenham, everybody. Uh, if you're visiting um, for the first time, welcome. If you're a regular visitor, we're glad that you're here. Um, it's been a little while since I've been up here. I, I went to America, I came back, I took communion, and then I left for another two weeks. Uh, we had big camp, which was a real blessing. Um, I got to spend um, the Easter long weekend with my... Uh, middle son, Max, working in the little kinder t division at big camp, um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and then we, we were foolish enough, my wife and I, to decide to go to the Great Ocean Road with our, four, our three kids, not a fourth, no fourth, uh, <laughs> with our three kids to the Great Ocean Road for this week. The conference gave us some days off in lieu of big camp. Uh, so it's been good, but... Um, just so you know, I'm back, okay? Now I'm properly back. If you need your pastor, if you need a call, um, I'm back and we can get things going. We can get the ball rolling on a few things. Um, but I'm, good. I'm glad to be here. I'm really excited uh, for one simple reason. It's because we get to start our sermon series in the book of Acts. Who's excited? Oh, yeah, good. I'm excited. Um, I, when we finished in Luke uh, just before Christmas... I was like, all right, we've got to do Acts, and it's literally taken between Christmas and now to start because of the stops and the starts. So if you want to follow along, every week I will be teaching from the book of Acts, and basically I will be preaching probably like three, to tw uh, three times to twice a month, and we'll have visiting uh, speakers or our local elders sharing as well. But every time I'll be with you, I'll be teaching from the book of Acts, and I'm really excited to do this. Uh, we were in Luke, and just so you know, for context, Acts is part two of the story, okay? And um, just by way of introduction, um, this is not something I share as a brag, but something that really enriched my life, and I know most people can't do this, but when I was a university student studying to be a minister, I had this opportunity to go to uh, the Mediterranean, to actually go to a lot of the places that are mentioned in the book of Acts. And it was such a blessing to actually be able to go to these places, not in some holy osmosis, I'm in the place Jesus walked and now it's transferring to me, nothing like that, but just to actually be in these places. To sort of, I know we're, we're, you know, we're almost 2,000 years removed from these stories, but to experience some of that Mediterranean culture, to see what it's like, to smell the smells, you know, to walk. I mean, we traveled a lot on this trip. We started our trip in Rome, we ended in Egypt, and literally everything in between we, we looked. We went to Turkey, to Greece, to Jerusalem, to um, Jordan. And you go to all of these places, and what struck, struck me, we were on this trip for six weeks. We were in buses and planes. Sometimes we were on a boat. But you, you, you stop and you think as you're going through all of these places. Man, we've been at this for six weeks. Flying, driving, it's 40 degrees outside. I mean, there is this, you start to realize that there is this deep, commitment to share Jesus that these first century Christians had, right? There's this really deep commitment to the point where they are not driving, they are not flying. These men and women are walking from town to town to share this faith that they have, to share something that has affected them in such a profound way. Like when you start to think about that, you're like, man, that's that's actually pretty, it's a pretty profound thing. It's a very deep commitment that these people have. And it kind of challenged me just to think, just in spatial terms, that these people were prepared to go through so much for the God that they had encountered. So I want to journey with you this year, for the remainder of this year, through the story of Acts. Um, Acts is um, probably... Uh, one of the later books that were written in the New Testament, it's the, one of the longest actually in the New Testament. It covers the years of approximately 30 to 33 um, AD to the year 60 AD. So it covers about a 30-year span. 
And the length of the book is probably dictated by the length of the scroll Luke had to write on, which is a very interesting thing. But it is very long. He has a lot to say. But because of the length of the scroll, he cannot say everything he wants to say. Okay, this is about the church and its origins. This is by no means a history of the church. I mean, there are so many unanswered questions, and I'd encourage you to read the book of Acts. It is a real page turner. It's just narrative. You're seeing one story from another flow into the next, into the next. So you're getting all of these stories, right? But as you're reading, you're like, well, okay, it starts with these 12 disciples who would become the 12 apostles, the 12 apostello, the 12 sent ones, okay? And it follows very closely to Peter. But you ask yourself, Peter eventually disappears, like, well, where did Peter go? What, what's Peter doing? Where did, where did um, the other disciples, where did James go? Where did, where did Andrew go? We have, no, we have no recollection of this in the book of Acts. We have a sense, and we might touch on this later on, but we have no sense from the book of Acts. It's not a history. I mean, Paul will go to prison in Rome, and we just don't know if he succeeded in his mission to, to talk to Caesar. We don't know what happened to him after he was in prison. Did he die? Some people think he did. Some people think he was set free. We just don't know. So it's not a comprehensive history. What it is, is a, it's God's retelling of the mission of the church. Now, usually two groups love the book of Acts for very, I wouldn't say very different reasons. Um, there are people who are very focused on, on evangelism, and they love the book of Acts. That's probably me. I love the book of Acts just to see how did they do things in that first century at a snail's pace. Remember, they're just walking around. How did they do things? So there's a group of people who are very interested from that perspective. That's me. Then there's another group of people who are very interested because of the supernatural things that are happening in this book. And let's just be honest, supernatural things happen in this book. There are angels, there are miracles, there are just like narrow escapes from death, okay? Incredible things happen. And, and, and probably our more charismatic brothers and sisters love the book of Acts for that reason. It's a very Holy Spirit-filled book. And we're going to be focusing on the Holy Spirit today, in fact. Now, what I want to propose to you is that the book of Acts, it, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have mission without the Spirit. And to best understand the book of Acts, you need to bring Spirit and mission together, because that's how this book works. It's not a story of, of men and women who are like, we want to share Jesus, and now we're going in our own strength. No, no. It's not just about miracles and people getting bitten by snakes and all sorts of crazy. All of this happens within the context of mission. You have to marry the two together to make sense of the book of Acts. And so all of that hopefully will help you understand. The book is addressed to Theophilus, who the book of Luke was addressed to. And Theophilus, we think, may have been a wealthy patron or it may have been a, a nice little um, way that Luke was addressing the reader. We're not sure. Theophilus, Theo, God, Philo, love, lover, God, lover. He's writing to somebody who loves God. Okay? So who is it? We're not 100% sure. It probably was a rich person. Was his name Theophilus? We're not 100% sure. But with that, we're going to jump into the book, and we've got a lot to cover today. So get into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, and we're going to walk through the first 10 verses together. And I want to take a little pause towards the end, because I want to focus in on some teachings of Jesus that help us better understand this book. So with that, let's read. I'm going to just say a quick prayer, because um, I want to speak uh, the words that are relevant for our community this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, we are here. We are ready to get into the word. We are looking at the story of the church. Jesus came with a mission. He taught, he preached, he did miracles, he healed, but he wanted to impart the qualities, the DNA of the church. And now that he is, he, he, he's, he's about to go 
to heaven, wherever he is right now, he will impart, he will inspire his followers to take up his mantle. And so as we look at these passages today, I pray that you'll speak through me, is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to pick up in verse 1 of uh, the book of Acts, okay? Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. So it says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So the book of Acts assumes that you've read Luke. And if you have not been with us, if you didn't get to be here last year, lucky for you, we've got some quality guys at the sound desk over there. Do you want to wave, guys? There they are. They don't get acknowledged very often, but our great team there, they record every week our sermon. So you can go watch online at our website any message that we we covered in the series on Luke. But Theophilus needs to know that we've talked about Jesus, okay, and all that he began to do. See, Jesus hasn't stopped doing just because Luke is done. Jesus hasn't stopped. He has begun a work. And that work continues today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. And so we're going to be focusing on this work that Jesus begun and continues. Get to, we'll skip to verse 3. So Jesus presented himself alive to them, them being the disciples, the, the students literally of Jesus, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Verse 4, and while staying with them, and some translations say while eating with them, I think that's a nice little detail, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this is a book, like I said, it's about mission, but that mission, key to that mission's success is the Holy Spirit. We're going to spend a lot of time reading about the Holy Spirit this year, okay? If you don't know about the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does, we will see this this year, especially today we're going to be looking at this. Now, Jesus says, you've heard me talk about the Spirit. You've heard me make reference to the Spirit. And we didn't get to talk about the Spirit all the time. We, didn't, we skipped over lots of things in Luke's Gospel. Now, in particular, in Luke chapter 3 and Luke chapter 11, Jesus talks about the Spirit. Uh, we actually talked about this uh, Luke chapter 11 at not last week's prayer meeting. I couldn't make it. I was on the Great Ocean Road. But the week before that, we talked about this in our prayer meeting. Please come. It's a great time, guys. In Luke 11, verse 13, Jesus said, If you then who are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus has told a story about a man who comes knocking at night. He needs something from his neighbor, and the neighbor's like, ah, please don't wake me up. My kids are asleep. Everybody slept in in one big room. It's like camping, literally. Everybody's in one room, and it, it took forever to get your kids to sleep when you're camping. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah? You have three kids under seven. It's called foolishness. Um, but you, you don't want somebody coming to your house, knocking on the door because it's going to wake up Macy, it's going to wake up Harry, it's going to wake up Max, and you just you actually just want to quickly deal with it. And so you're like, all right, what do you want? Okay, I'll give you what you want. And Jesus is saying tongue-in-cheek, like, if we're, we're prepared to be like that, how much more is God going to be generous How much more is God going to be willing to give what we need, what we we need to ask from Him? And so He says these words, look, if you want the Holy Spirit, just ask, don't hesitate. So guys, so many of us hesitate to come to God. So many of us hesitate to talk to Him about the things we need, the things we want. And, And Jesus is saying, guys, I want to give the Holy Spirit to you generously, Do we ask generously for the Holy Spirit? It's not something I ask for in in, in copious amounts, I must admit. Okay? 
uh, on this trip to America, I, I'm sort of seeing things, different churches, how they operate, churches that are very missional, they're very focused on the community, getting out of their four walls and into society. And, and I'm praying and I'm reflecting as I'm driving along with my good friend, Pastor Fraser Catton, and, and I, 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 I know this might sound weird, but I'm praying and I'm saying, God, what do you need me to know? What do you need me to understand from what I'm seeing, what I've been learning? And one word keeps coming back to me time and time again. And that word is death. <laughs> like, oh, I'm in America, hooray. God, what do you need me to see? Die. Oh, okay, that's nice. Am I going to die? No, just you need to look at what it means to die in Scripture. And friends, to receive the Spirit, it's all about dying to self. And we are going to explore this over quite possibly next week. We're going to look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what does it really mean to die? To receive the Holy Spirit into your life. And we really ask for it. Because God is saying He wants to give it generously. So we have Him promising. He's talked about this. Okay? And we're going to revisit more of Jesus' words later. But we pick up in verse 6. So he says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? On the minds of the disciples, they are good Jewish people. And you need to read Scripture actually often through a Jewish lens. You need to put some Jewish glasses on to understand what they're thinking. You see, the Jews, their primary concern is, when will this kingdom, they still think this kingdom is going to be about the might of Israel coming to suppress Rome. Israel is going to come and establish itself as the rightful, you know, um, kingdom that is going to rule everybody, it's going to conquer everyone, it's going to vanquish everyone. Okay, that's what they are expecting. And, and that's their hope. And look, I'm, I'm, I would be lying to you if I said Scripture does not address this. The New Testament, in fact, does talk about this. We don't really look at it a whole lot as Seventh-day Adventists. It does focus on this. Maybe I would differ with a lot of our Christian brothers on the interpretation of how this thing will work. It's a whole other sermon. But they are interested. Jesus, when are, when are we actually going to see this kingdom? And Jesus' answer is so telling. In verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Okay? In our Sabbath school question this morning, I was asked, what do you think, Pastor Ryan, about focusing on the end of the world? And I was like, wow, it's not my favorite pastime. Uh, I don't know about for some of you, but a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, we love to look at all of the events that are happening. If Jesus were here, we would ask him, maybe not when is Israel going to be made Israel. We're going to ask, when is this doomsday event going to happen? And when's the Pope going to do that? And when's the American president going to say this? That's what we would ask. And I think to that, Jesus would in fact say, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Are we okay with that? I'm not saying discard everything, forget about everything. Things are going to happen, right? Are we told in Scripture things are going to happen? Yes, yeah, some pretty crazy things are going to happen. But Jesus says don't make that the sole focus of what we're doing. Watch what he says, verse 8. You will receive power, okay? You will receive power, and that word power, anytime you see it, Nine times out of ten, it's the Greek word dunamis, dynamite. Not just power like, you know, when we, when we bring our caravan home from camping, it's a pop-up trailer thing, it's a little Jayco and the rooms pop out on the side. We live in a row of townhouses and we can't actually, I can't, I, I, guys, I hope the men do not um, see me as less of a man. I can't reverse my trailer down the driveway. <laughs> I practiced at the Dog showgrounds, but we've got a neighbor who parks here and a neighbor there, and I've got to like sort of just shimmy my way in, and I'm just like, Emma, I can't do this. Uh, so what we do is we drive in, we unhitch the, the trailer, we push the trailer into the neighbor's uh, parking area, then I pull the car, I drive the caravan around, and Emma and I, with our 
dunamis power. We have to push this thing, twist, turn it around. I then can hook the four-wheel drive and back it the rest of the way. Okay? But man, you need dunamis power to do that. <laughs> the other day we came back from big camp. It had been raining cats and dogs and I'm pushing and I'm sliding and I look like a fool. And I, God, I need your strength. <laughs> like, guys, to do what Jesus is calling us to do, in the book of Acts, what he's calling his disciples to do. It's not just feeble Pastor Ryan energy. I read books for a living, okay? That's my job. I don't lift heavy things. I will admit that. You need some supernatural strength to do what God is calling us to do. And I think that's something maybe the church loses sight of from time to time. I like preaching from here because as I preach to you, I often will see people walking by, sometimes kids running up the steps. And when I read this, what I see in Scripture, God is saying, it's going to take dunamis power to reach these people. Do you understand that? It's not just simple me trying to flex and do anything in my own strength. It's going to take, but you will receive power. Not just, not just lower P powers. My grandfather would say uppercase P, uppercase O, uppercase W, uppercase E, uppercase R. Power. Bold. That's what it's going to take to do this job. So many of you guys have asked me, what are we going to do in evangelism this or, or an outreach that? For me, maybe call this lazy, but interpret this how you will. I don't want to take a step unless, until I know we are operating in the strength of the Holy Spirit. That for me is 100%. Because any time of being a part of something where we didn't pray for God to work in and through us, we were just spinning our wheels. Jesus says, don't focus on Israel's becoming a big prominent superpower. Adventist church of the 21st century, don't focus, don't make your soul focus the Pope and Rome and America and all this and like, look at those things, sure, but here's what you need to do. You will receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And I think he's got this veiled answer here, but guys, the thing you're actually hoping for will happen when you receive the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought, Seventh-day Adventist Church here today and friends who are visiting, that the things we are wanting to see will happen when there is a spirit-filled people going out into the world and the world is actually responding to a spirit-filled people who are pushing all of their buttons and annoying them because, man, these God people are just different. We're waiting for something to happen, but God's waiting for us to be filled. And when we're filled and we're having an impact in the world, that's when people are going to notice and go, huh, we've got to do something about these people. They're annoying us. They're grating on us. I mean, that's how it happens in the third world. I love to read books about this. It only seems to happen when God's people are triggered and they are responding and they are are in activity. It's not going to happen because we're sitting here today on Sabbath. We pray, God, thank you that we're here in Sabbath and we are free from persecution. We're free from persecution because we're not agitating anyone. (laughs) I I don't want to be rude and I don't want us to have this militant, we must go and wage war. No, 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 I don't think like that. But the reality is, as I read scripture, persecution comes when people go out into the world filled with God. Literally, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come and you will be my witness. The word witness is martyr. You will be my martyr when you are filled with the Spirit and go out into the world. He's not necessarily saying you're going to die, but there's almost this veiled reference. Things are going to happen once you've been filled with the Spirit. Is that making sense? So to this end, people are like, what is the book of Acts called? It's it's literally called the Acts of the Apostles. But some have argued that maybe it really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. If we're wanting to see God work in our church today, we need the Acts of the Holy Spirit working in and through us, right? That's what this book is all about. So Jesus now has mentioned twice that the Holy Spirit is really important. He says, 
you know, you should remember my words on this. And, and I'm going to jump back into the Gospels. I'm going to actually go to John. Next week, we're going to look at Luke talking a bit about the Spirit. But I want you to go to John because I think this is really important. For us to make sense of what we're about to see, we need to understand more about the Spirit. So go to John 16 if you can. And we're going to read a few verses. Here, Jesus is talking about the Spirit in John 16. John 16, and we're going to pick up in verse um, 7. So in verse 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now, I want you to notice how many times the word you is referenced. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. How many times does Jesus mention you or your in some capacity? Anyone? Four. Four times. Now, in Scripture, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Bible repeats something twice, kind of important. Bible references something three times in a short period, in a short space. That's pretty, that's really focused, guys. If the Bible mentions something four times, well, that's just usually not a, a quantifiable thing you see. But here we see Jesus references you four times. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit. He thinks that you should receive the Holy Spirit. And if you're counting, he mentions, I will do this five times. I, I, I want to give you, you, you the Holy Spirit. This is a big deal for Jesus that, remember this, you receive dynamite power. Okay? Now, just I just need to, I keep pausing because I don't know if it's the spirit or my own mind. Little things come into mind. We're not talking about walking up walls or running around waving flags. You know what I'm talking about when I say receive power, right? It's the indwelling of Jesus to be who he's called us and designed us to be. It's to be that witness. It's not necessarily to do anything supernatural per se, but it's just to have the indwelling of God inside of us. And things happen when God lives inside of us. But in John, he's saying, you, you, you guys need to realize I am giving you this gift. This is for our advantage, church, to receive this gift. Note that the Comforter is only going to come, this Holy Spirit will only come when Jesus goes away. In verse 8, he says, and when he comes, and I'm going to add in brackets here because it doesn't say it, but you could almost add it. When he comes in brackets to you, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Notice what's happening here. It's only until you receive the Spirit that the world is actually going to prick their ears up. The world does not care. The world will not notice. The world will not see our church. The world will not, you know, they, they won't give a flying anything about our church until we are filled with the Spirit. Can you see that? When he comes, in quotations, to you, he will convict the world. It only happens when we are infilled with the Spirit. This is when things start to happen, friends. Why is Jesus making such a big deal of this? I'll give you a practical example. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but there's a church that meets here on a Sunday. Pastor Richard, show and make a good friend. I meet with a group of pastors from time to time, all the Packenham pastors. We talk about the challenges of ministry. They're good, God-fearing people. And time and time and again, they've, we've, in our group meetings, they've said, look, we've tried this approach to reaching the community. We've tried that. Everybody has tried letterboxing the entire community. I know some of you guys live in the lakeside area. Only late last year, there was a big letterbox drop of Alpha Course. You guys know Alpha Course? Alpha is kind of like the major outreach that the evangelical church uses, if you're Baptist or Pentecostal or Presbyterian. Um, they, they use Alpha Course. I've looked at it. It's actually pretty good. And, and 
a major letterbox drop was done right here in Pakenham in the lakeside area. Over a thousand homes letterboxed. How many people came? Four. And you know what? People like, you know, that's still four people for the kingdom. And I say, amen. But when I read this, I actually think it's being filled with the Spirit, which is the best invitation you could have. It's when you're filled with the Spirit, people are going to be like, man, that guy's camping with three kids and he hasn't lost his cool. I lost my cool. Uh, <laughs> that's why I use this example. They'd be like, man, what's up with this guy? They're like, hey, you've been, you've like, you've been pretty cool cucumber, man. It's the Spirit living inside of me, my brother. I need to have him. How many parents would want to have the Holy Spirit if they knew you could keep their cool with their kids? I'm telling you, so many would say, I want that. <laughs> Some of the parents are laughing who still remember what it's like to have kids. But guys, I'm not saying letterboxing is bad. I'm not saying that running the Revelation Seminar is bad. But guys, it won't make a difference if you and I aren't filled with God's Holy Spirit. Can you see that from Jesus' words? Okay? This is my big focus. This is why I really want to preach through this story. Because I want us to see what happens. These stories were meant for us to be inspired. In verse 9, well, I'll, I'll read verse 8 again. When he comes to you, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. In verse 9, Jesus continues, he's going to convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you'll see me no longer, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Look at the ways that the Holy Spirit impacts people's lives when we allow him to live inside of us. When the dynamite power is unleashed, Jesus is saying, the world's actually going to, you don't need a, I don't know how it's going to work, but the world's going to realize that they have a sin problem, the world's going to realize that there's a standard that is so far above what they know. It's called righteousness, but it's something that they can attain. They're going to realize that, and they're going to realize that the person that they have maybe knowingly or unknowingly following, that person is being judged because their system in which they have proposed that's going to lead to life and joy and contentment, it's actually baseless. It's actually useless. The world will be convicted of these things when we are filled with the Spirit. Amen? Isn't that what we want to have for our family, for our friends, for our work colleagues? Friends, it's when Jesus lives inside of us through the Holy Spirit that incredible things start to happen. He continues in verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will, and, and watch this, I've got a rapid fire because I'm using up my time. In verse 13, he will guide, 13, he'll guide you into all truth, okay? He's not going to speak on his own authority, the Holy Spirit. It's not about him, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So he's not speaking on his own accord. He's speaking from what God is putting in front of him to speak, okay? In verse 14, he will glorify me. He's the Spirit will glorify Jesus through our lives. He will take what is mine, what is Jesus's, and He's going to give it to you. He's going to declare it to you. And finally, verse 15, All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that He will take what is mine and declare it to you. There seems to be this kind of divine pass the parcel happening. Jesus is receiving from the Father, and Jesus is handing it over to the Holy Spirit, who is now handing it over to us. And the cool thing about this Pass the Parcel game is we get to open at every stage. Who likes Pass the Parcel? Who hasn't played Pass the Parcel in over 10 years of the whole church? God wants you to play Pass the Parcel, friends. He's so excited for you to open what he has for you, Okay. Things happen when we let the Spirit live inside of us. When we let this power, this think about this, the Holy Spirit is God. And, and, and at God's word, this whole world came into existence. And now that God, through the Holy Spirit, wants to indwell you, what 
what, what, what possibilities could happen in your little ecosystem as the God of this universe lives inside of you and now starts to affect the world around you? Things will start to come to life. And that's the point of all of this. This kingdom is a kingdom unlike any other kingdom. God is wanting to do something incredible. I want to read this quote and we'll, we'll, we'll just about land the plane. This is a quote I saw in one of my commentaries as I was reading this week because I thought it was worth mentioning. It says, friends, the spirit, however, is more than the necessary means to fulfill a task. He's not just a means to an end. The connection of the Holy Spirit and the experience of God as Father suggests that the presence of the Holy Spirit is part of a close family relationship with God. They're saying what we're doing here, it's not we're just, God's not just giving us the Holy Spirit so we can be amazing. He's actually allowing us to enter into his family, right? The tr I always like to think of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as family. And we are being invited into that family. The Spirit is a person of the Trinity. And if you don't believe that, you need to find another church or talk to me. I'm very serious on that. We believe in the Godhead at this church. Until we do, nothing happens. And you can go reconcile that in your own thoughts if you disagree with me. But I see God is inviting us to have a dynamic relationship with the third person of the Godhead. To have a friendship with him. The emphasis on the Spirit as a gift indicates that the Spirit's presence is a powerful experience of God's grace. And so we come back to Acts, and then we finish in chapter 1, verse 9. And when Jesus, he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and they said, in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And friends, I like to think that this is the bookend that we need to think about. We are Seventh-day Adventists, in case you don't know what that means, we love, we think the Sabbath is a really important day, it reveals a lot about God, what He's done, He's rescued us, He's redeemed us, but He's also a creator God. We rest on the Sabbath because He created and because He's delivered us, amen? But the Adventist part says we are looking forward to Jesus' coming back. We are so ready for this moment to happen. As much as I love Big Camp, Elmore inspires me to look forward to heaven. <laughs> it's just a dry, flat dust bowl. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> My caravan is covered in dust. <laughs> we have to sweep it and clean everything. I just want, I'm looking forward to just whatever heaven has. I know it's going to be better than a dust bowl. But friends, I feel like Jesus, he says these words and he goes. And, you know, they say when somebody leaves or somebody dies, the last things they say are the most important things. I, I connected with my cousin on this trip who um, I've only met four times, but it's weird how family ties can just connect you instantly. Do you know what I'm talking about? And she's like the older sister I never had. She's 10 years older. And I leave her and I just said, you know what? I just love you so much. And we just like hugged for five minutes. I just, we, it was just really, it was a real emotional moment. But that's what I needed. I wanted her to know that I love you. And even though... We literally live on the other side of the planet. You've got somebody who cares about you. That's what I wanted her to know. Jesus wanted his people to know when he left, I will come back when you have finished the mission of being spirit-filled people who've gone into the world. We talk about, you know, bringing the message of Jesus, the three angels' message. Have you ever stopped to think the gospel can go into the whole world, but that's not the mission complete? It's the it's, it's, it's the message of Jesus gone into the world through a spirit-filled people. Sometimes I wonder, has the message gone into the whole world? Maybe it has by now, but has it been through a spirit-filled people? I don't think it has yet. Maybe in little pockets here and there, but maybe in Australia, it is yet to happen through spirit-filled people. Maybe there are little churches here and they're happening, but I would love for Packetham Church to be a church that is spirit-filled 
going into the world. With that, I'm going to invite our singers to come and sing our final song. It's one of my favorites. It's a song we sang in Dandenong Church when I was growing up all the time, and that's Seeking the Lost. As we sing Seeking the Lost, I want you to think we're seeking the lost as spirit-filled people. Next week, we're going to look a little bit more about what it means and how we get to become a spirit-filled person. But I want to get your brain flowing for this week, okay? I want you to be challenged as to, you know, okay, God, I want this. How do we do this? That's the right question to ask. Let's sing.